Uh, this panel is on competing economies, and the three papers will explore both those counter economies and their supportive networks around the Circum Caribbean from the coast of Colombia through the Greater Antilles. Our first speaker will be Juan Justi Cordero, um, Professor of History at the University of Puerto, Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Sorry, that sounds better in my head than it, my tongue is able to, to produce. Um, uh, Professor Justi holds a PhD in sociology from SUNY Binghamton and has been co-editor of Sugarlandia Revisited, Sugar and Colonialism in Asia and the Americas, 1800 to 1940, and he has also written extensively on the social history of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean more broadly. Professor Giusti was recently named acad academic coordinator for the newly created Sidney Bintz Gordon Lewis Caribbean Collections at UPR Rio Piedras. Our second speaker will be Jennifer Anderson, um, associate professor of Atlantic history at SUNY Stony Brook, or is, it, or is it just Stony Brook University now? Either way, okay. Um, she holds a PhD in history from New York University, and her recent book, uh, Mahogany, the Cost of Luxury in Early America, just came out from Harvard University Press in 2012. Um, I will mention here, although it's not in Jenny's formal bio, that this book is based on her Nevins Award-winning dissertation. Uh, so it's, it's first a piece of first-rate research and writing. The book examines the complex history of colonial tropical timber industry, and, and Jenny also recently curated an exhibition at NYU about Sylvester Manor, a 17th century slave plantation in New York that was set up to provision the Barbados sugar plantation of the owners. Her new research project focuses on the circumatlantic connections of the influential Codrington family and is part of a larger collaboration with archaeologist Georgia Fox, who is currently excavating Betty's Hope, a Codrington plantation in Antigua. Their goal is to develop a more comprehensive economic and environmental history of this important Caribbean historic site. And our third presenter will be Ernesto Bassi, assistant professor of history at Cornell, who completed his PhD in history at the University of California, Irvine in 2012. Uh, Professor Bossi's research explores the role of circulation of people, goods, ideas, and news in the configuration of geographic spaces, geopolitical projects, and identities. His current book project, provisionally titled Between Imperial Projects and National Dreams, Embracing the Atlantic from New Gr Granada's Caribbean Shores, 1760 to 1860, traces the configuration of a trans-imperial, transnational Greater Caribbean during the Age of Revolutions and the ways in which communication networks influenced the geopolitical imagination of its inhabitants. Professor Bossi is from Caribbean Colombia and has lived in the United States for six years. So without further ado, Professor Justi. Hello, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the, for this wonderful conference. Thanks to the organizers and to the John Carter Brown Library. It is my pleasure to talk about uh, contraband in not just the great meeting, but in the contraband capital that was Rhode Island in the 18th century. <laughs> uh, the title of my presentation, updated, is sugar and livestock. I'll be talking about mules, but more generally also about cattle. But I will be talking about contraband networks in the Caribbean. In the 1780s, the French colony of Saint-Domingue was the wealthiest slave plantation co economy in the world. Over 450,000 slaves of a total population of 520,000 toiled in its 8,000 plantations. Saint-Domingue was a major producer of coffee and indigo, but sugarcane and was the source of the colony's greatest riches, and its 800 sugar plantations had the largest number of slaves and the highest profits. As C.L.R. James memorably described it, I quote, field upon field, the light green sugar cane continually rippled in the breeze and closed the factory and the dwelling houses like a sea. Close quotes, hundreds of huge sugar factories, as James wrote, covered the North Plain of Saint-Domingue, the Plan du Nord, 
the cane fields and sugar factories, which is here. The cane fields and sugar factories, sucreries of the Plan du Nord, were especially concentrated in a 200 kilometer square kilometer zone just south of Cap Francois, Le Cap, which was right around here. The Plan du Nord was the heartland of Saint-Domingue sugar production. Not incidentally, this would also be the heartland of the Saint-Domingue slave revolution. East of Le Cap, the Plan du Nord becomes the Valle del Cibao, a major region of the neighboring Spanish colony of Santo Domingo. The Spanish two-thirds of Hispaniola was strikingly different from Saint Domingue. Three mountain chains crossed Hispaniola, but on the Spanish side, the mountains were higher, covered with dense forests and blessed with copious rainfall brought by northeast winds. That kind of shows the mountains. That's a map from uh, Sanchez Valverde, his classic work on, on Santo Domingo. The Cordillera Central, which is known on the west side as the Massif du Nord, here, rises over 3,000 meters in Santo Domingo. That's a, a note uh, from a book that uh, Fernando Ortiz work, uh, worked on uh, with Maximilian Sor on, in the Caribbean, and shows the mountains of the Caribbean. The very highest ones are in the Spanish side of Hispaniola. Uh, the, the highest in Cuba, in Sierra Maestra, is here, number one. And Haiti has also taller mountains. Puerto Rico is right around. <laughs> Uh, uh, lower, uh, really uh, 3,000 meters, very high for the Caribbean, are the tallest mountains, and that's on the Spanish side. The valley of the Plan du Nord has attains its greatest breadth in Santo Domingo and was favored by rainfall and river basins. On the whole, the western leeward side of Hispaniola was, is drier, less forested, its rivers fewer and less predictable. Moreau de saint Marie wrote that Saint Domingue is hotter and more exposed to droughts, which he noted had become more frequent and longer with deforestation. In the valleys and savannas of Spanish Santo Domingo, there were some 200,000 corralled or penned cattle. There were also, Moreau estimated, 50,000 more in the wild through the Spanish colony's thick ecology of montes, rugged forested terrain, plus 50,000 donkeys and horses, wild and otherwise, for a total livestock population of 300,000. Livestock far outnumbered the Spanish colony's population, which was less than 180,000 in 1780. Twice as large as Saint-Domingue, Santo Domingo had only a third of its population. While Saint-Domingue had five African slaves for every free white, Santo Domingo had just the opposite proportion. Despite their differences, indeed because of them, the eastern and western parts of Hispaniola did not exist in isolation from each other. Indeed, an old and active livestock trade linked the Spanish and French sides of Hispaniola. That's the distribution of population. In, in Hispaniola. An old and active, active livestock trade linked the Spanish and French sides. This commerce was chiefly with cattle, but also included mules. Saint Domingue purchased cattle both for meat and as work animals, as oxen. Mules turned the colony's sugar mills and transported people and goods. Pigs from the Spanish colony were also in demand in Saint Domingue, especially for making lard, widely used in the local cuisine. Livestock from Santo Domingo and from other Spanish colonies, as we will see, was a key dimension of Saint Domingue's explosive success as a slave plantation economy. Well informed observers in the French and Spanish colonies recognized the importance of Hispaniola's east west interaction. Antonio Sanchez Valverde and Moreau de Saint Marie wrote extensively on the importance of Saint Domingue's cattle trade with Santo Domingo. Contemporary Dominican historians have also recognized these interactions. Frank Moya Pons notes, this cattle trade between the French and the Spanish in the island of Santo Domingo, writes Moya Pons, marked the relations between both colonies during the entire 18th century and was one of the supports, soportes as he calls it, of the sugar revolution of San Domingue. Franklin Franco has characterized the relationship between the two colonies as one of juxtaposition and interaction. And Roberto Casa even affirms that the Spanish and French colonies in Hispaniola configured a model of division of labor and that Santo Domingo was an economic subcolony of Saint Domingue. Yet the full implications for Caribbean historiography of the close interactions between East and West Hispaniola have remained less visible, perhaps hiding in plain sight. One difficulty has been the largely illegal nature of the island's livestock trade, which makes for scant documentation. A more important obstacle to our understanding may be the ways in which Caribbean historiography has envisaged relations between the Spanish Caribbean and the non-Hispanic Caribbean in the 17th and 18th centuries. 
two contrasting models have prevailed. One model posits a single, largely uniform plantation economy model for the Caribbean, defined by flat coastal ecologies, large-scale slave plantation production, dense, overwhelmingly slave populations, racially sharply polarized societies, and monocrop export, principally sugar, all as a consequence of a serial sugar revolution. Any Caribbean society that does not fit the plantation model in the 17th, 18th century, such as the Spanish Antilles, is deemed to have been on its way sooner or later to a sugar revolution. In the meantime, those Hispanic Caribbean societies are seen as rather formless backwaters, even dormant, as one intrepid historian put it, waiting for their turn in the relay race of Caribbean plantations, or to return to their race, so to speak, as the Spanish Antilles did have an early sugar slavery epoch in the 16th century. Sidney Mintz, who has often been, been read as assuming an overarching plantation model for the 17th and 18th century Caribbean, an incorrect reading of his work, in my view, also offered a contrasting, cogent historical account of the three Spanish Antilles, a significantly highland, forested ecologies, thinly populated, cattle-based, smallholder economies, and a mixed-race creole societies, as they, they have been called, with a history of their own. Harry Hotink, based on his work in the Dominican Republic, contrasted these models for the Caribbean as, as a whole and developed them as two variants in race relations. However, recent perspectives on the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th centuries suggest that these twin models of Caribbean historical development have not sufficiently allowed for mutual interactions, especially through contraband trade between the territories characterized by each model. Indeed, the sharpness with which these models are often drawn virtually excludes the possibility of interaction, let alone of a, let alone of a reciprocal shaping of the models through that interaction. The contrasting sugar cattle plantation hidden hinterland models are all the more limited because they tend to consider only the archipelago and sidestep the Caribbean coastal regions of the Spanish colonies in Central and South America, a point to which I shall return. I have something here on Hispaniola's early history, which I'll skip. Uh, we've talked about that yesterday also. Uh, and I'll skip to the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers, which, which, as we know, were based initially on the offshore island of Tortuga, then on the mainland, here's Tortuga, then uh, they moved uh, over the 17th century on the mainland of what we become Saint-Domingue. The last Buccaneers would become the first habitants, sugar, coffee, and indigo planters. The origins of the French colony of Saint-Domingue were closely linked to the cattle economy, the island's ecology, and the past social history of the island. The key corridor of that cattle economy, of course, was the Cibao Plan du Nord. Writing from the Spanish side, Sanchez Valverde described the 225 kilometer long Cibao Valley as a plain without interruption or significant elevations that ends in the plain occupied by the French, called the Guarico, and which is watered by innumerable reeks, rivers, creeks, and streams. As early as 1700, the inhabitants, I quote Sanchez, the inhabitants of the interior of Santo Domingo, Santiago, La Vega, Azua, Incha, had established an active communication with the French colony, which they supplied with, with livestock, mules for the mills, in exchange for liquor, aguardiente, which was manufactured on the French side, textiles and clothes. Attempts to limit or tax the cattle trade were never quite successful. A tax on cattle exports to the French colony in 1720 sparked the tumultos de Santiago, an armed confrontation between cattle raisers of Santiago and authorities from the capital who tried to establish border checkpoints. The capital of Santo Domingo had chronic shortages of meat, yet selling cattle to the capital involved, involved a longer and more difficult journey than across the Cibao Valley to the French. The Dominican Creoles would not stop the trade, nor were the colonial authorities inclined to consent it, or they would lose their economic protagonism. So they claimed, but they had already lost it. Cattle and mule raising was most widespread in the areas closest to the French colony, and some very large livestock holdings and even towns developed near the frontier on account of the cattle trade. But even the Eastern Cibao, way over here, uh, even the Eastern Cibao, known as La Vega, which lay at a greater distance from San Domingue, was largely devoted to cattle raising, even though it was an extraordinarily fertile area with great agricultural potential. Sanchez Valverde lamented in the 1780s that La Vega was, I quote, of no use at present for us, but to sustain the French and to provide them with mules, beasts, and oxen, 
to move the machinery of their sugar mills and to carry their product. This is why they call us their herdsmen. Actually, lazy herdsmen is the phrase that the French use, pastores poltrones, lazy herdsmen. But Sanchez Valverde added, Riley, this is also what they are, why they are also our dependents. Lacking as they do breeding places or criaderos, they would, necessarily abandon their, they would necessarily abandon their numerous and extensive plantations and would be forced to evacuate the island were we to cease to, were we to, cease to contribute to them with such assistance, he notes ironically. Moreau blamed the French colonists themselves for their early shift away from raising their own livestock to depending almost entirely on purchases from the Spanish colony. The French set apart little land for cattle raising, and apart from the original habitants, they refrained from livestock-related activity, generally as being a low-status occupation. In a sense, the French indeed relied on a division of labor in the island and devoted their effort to more lucrative, prestigious, the more lucrative, prestigious line of plantation production. There's an image eight. I skipped oh, Moreau. This is the area of Capaitien. It shows the Plan du Nord, south of Capaitien. This is a Spanish map, a detailed Spanish map from the mid-18th century of the area that they traded with. Uh, yeah, we've seen this. But now we're going to see something here. The oxen, not mules. Hard to find engravings of mules, uh, but uh, that's the, uh, we're going to talk about that later. And this is uh, sugar making as a high status occupation. We also saw that. Uh, the scope and volume of the cattle trade between the French and Spanish was staggering. In 1780, four, eight, 1780, four fifths of the cattle that was purchased annually by San Domingue, that is over 18,000, originated in Santo Domingo. While roads and communications were difficult, this type of trade has a singular characteristic. The commodity, that is the livestock, transports itself over terrain and through streams that would be impossible for wheeled transport. Livestock self-transport is actually done with a minimum of sustenance. Fattening pens at the other end restore the cattle and mules to market readiness. Uh, other contraband routes connected San Domingue with the 13 colonies US and with the Caribbean littoral of Spanish colonies on the mainland, particularly for the livestock trade, the Caribbean coast of New Spain and Venezuela. Cattle from Santo Domingo remained quite preponderant in San Domingue but the Spanish mainland colonies became main, the main mule exporters to San Domingue by the mid-18th century. Livestock from the 13 colonies US, including Rhode Island, New England, was imported to San Domingue, but its prices tended to be higher and would have greater difficulty in acclimation. It's our hero, a mule. Possibly a mule. It's a mule or mulet in French, possibly a mule, the French word, the French distinguish between male mules and female mules. So it's possibly, they call a female mulet a mule. No, a male mule is a mulet, but the female mule is called a bardot, which I found offensive, but a bardot. According to Dutron de la Couture, writing in the 1780s, only mules were used in the sugar mills of San Domingue. Moro, uh, Dutron is very, very definitive about this. Only mules were used in the sugar mills in San Domingue. An 80 mule pack was the average in the larger sucreries. I'm told that these are mules, but you can never be quite sure from the engravings. That's another problem. These are actually very stylized horses is what they look like, from, like carousel horses. But it's, it's, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the whole thing about art and culture, about plantation uh, illustrations that we were talking about yesterday also applied to animals. They were even the omitted or romanticized or softened. Uh, and uh, they were blindfolded, which I don't think is shown in the engravings. They were always blindfolded, the, both oxen and mules, as they turned the sugar mills. Five minutes? Wow. Uh, the mill in the engraving is open air, as many sugar mills were in Santo Domingo. There were a number of water-powered mills in the Plan du Nord, but river flows were highly variable, and information in them is fragmentary, even in Moreau and Dutron. Uh, 
Mules were a significant export from Santo Domingo to San Domingue earlier in the 18th century and continued to figure in the commerce between the two colonies. Sanchez indicates that wild donkeys were so numerous in Santo Domingo that they were hunted extensively and sold at low prices. Herds of wild donkeys roamed the Montes of Santo Domingo towards 1700 and to some extent still did in the 1780s. Mules were a leading component of the intra hispaniola trade until the 1740s when the Spanish-American mainland colonies became the major supplier. Mules are, of course, the offspring of mainly of male donkeys and female horses, i.e. mares. Mules are more difficult to breed and raise than cattle and are comparable to horses in this regard. They have a They have long gestation periods and single offspring births, but they also tend to have a high mortality rate before their third year. Mules thus require large herds of donkeys and especially mares. Mules are almost invariably sterile and there was no question of breeding mules with mules, which is why in Spanish sometimes something outlandish or unacceptable is described as pariola mula, or the, the mule had a, a, a baby, which is impossible, or very super, super rare. This is also, I should note, why mulato, mulata, and mulatra derive from mule and render it an especially offensive term. Despite their drawbacks, mules, whether male or female, it seems, were highly valued in Santo Domingo, in San Domingue, because of their strength and endurance, similar to donkeys, and intelligence and sure footedness, similar to horses, and a lifespan of 20, 30, or even 40 years, which was far longer than the average for oxen, which was about 10 years. Mules, which like oxen, turned sugar mills blindfolded, were the engine of the sugar mill engine. As Linda Rupert writes in Creolization and Contraband, mules were the motor of choice in Caribbean sugar mills. In several of the British and French islands, sugar mills were also known as mule mills. I have something on, on Jamaica and the, and the British Islands that I can talk about later if, 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 if there's interest. The trade circuits for uh, the material plantation inputs of San Domingue reach beyond Hispaniola. The mule trade in particular offers interesting perspectives. Since the eight, 1740s, when trade with Santo Domingo increased vigorously, San Domingue also expanded its trade with New Spain and the Venezuelan coast on the South American mainland in part using their legal trade with Santo Domingo as a subterfuge. The Spanish colony in South America trading with Santo Domingo, but in fact they were trading with San Domingue in many times, in many occasions. Moreau noted that a major reason for the shift was the occurrence of drought with increasing frequency, as well as inadequate breeding on the side of San Domingue, Santo Domingo. This, this led San Domingue planters to buy mules on the coast of the Spanish continent and in the Gulf of Mexico, imitating the Islas de Barlovento, as he said, which is the Spanish name for the Lesser Antilles which equally suffered from the same shortage of mules. Oh, this is uh, James Granger on the sugar cane. So we can see that you can make a poem to, to mules also. Uh, this is part of it's chapter three, and uh, of three long rollers, twice nine inches round, and finally winds up with a mule, harness two seasoned mules, they pacing round, give motion to the whole. That's the, the central role of, of mules in, in this story. Uh, San Domingue's mule trade with the Spanish colonial mainland was larger by mid-century than with Santo Domingo, where the cattle trade became even more predominant. So Santo Domingo shifted to cattle in the last decades, and uh, the, the mules came more and more from the South American mainland. Uh, Humboldt, who saw, observed this traffic directly after the Haitian Revolution around 1800, uh, even then that he, he estimated the traffic at about 30,000 mules a year between the Spanish American mainland and the Caribbean islands, particularly when at, at its prime in San Domingue. Uh, the trade networks and the coast of New Spain were in fact, uh, suggest the breadth and complexity of the social relations that configure the plantation economy. To conclude, the Hispanic and non-Hispanic Caribbean were both different and connected. Historians have noted the voracious consumptions by the sugar islands of work animals and timber, uh, which resulted in deforestation and overgrazing. This is uh, on the coast of Venezuela, you can see the, that connection. Uh, 
Less attention has been paid to the links between the ecologically rich Spanish colonies with their extensive forests and livestock populations and the far wealthier but ecologically impoverished sugar islands. The sugar revolutions in some, part of, in some parts of the Caribbean went hand in hand and indeed may have had as a precondition a cattle revolution in others. These plantation hinterland relations where hinterland was hardly a passive state existed not only between islands but within them, particularly in the larger islands. Uh, Saint-Domingue's, uh, indeed, the strengths of Hispaniola's intra-island regional configuration may have contributed to shaping the island's dual polities as much as the other way around. Saint-Domingue's trade circuit with the Spanish mainland colonies in New Spain and Venezuela also raised important questions about connections between the Caribbean archipelago, the coastal regions of Central and South America, and the 13 colonies US, and about the extent and boundaries, however fluid, of what we mean by Caribbean and its relationship with the Atlantic. In particular, we need to consider more closely the subcolonial, subnational regions on the Caribbean littoral of the continent from eastern Venezuela to Veracruz and the Gulf of Mexico. In all, these may be useful steps towards a more inclusive and challenging historiography of the Caribbean and of the Americas as a whole. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Um, this has been so much fun, and I want to thank again the organizers, and uh, Julie Kim in particular, who uh, encouraged me to, to submit a proposal when I initially hadn't uh, intended to, but now I have had a lot of time to reflect on the way in which, uh, indeed, uh, my research on mahogany is deeply intermeshed with the history of sugar in the Caribbean, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, today, particularly in the context of Jamaica. Uh, I realized in, uh, in re upon reflection, however, that the title of my paper as listed in this, uh, you know, in this particular panel is a little bit of a misnomer because it talks about mahogany as competition for sugar, but as uh, James Robertson intimated yesterday, it really needs to be thought of as something that was complementary to the sugar economy in, in many ways, but in ways that change over time. And on Jamaica in particular, we see what we can basically break down into three different phases of uh, engagement between people who were involved with uh, producing the sweet stuff and people who get involved with producing uh, tropical hardwoods for export coming out of the Caribbean um, and you know basically creating a market for fine furnishings that hadn't existed in quite the same way previously. Um, yesterday actually James set up my talk quite wonderfully by talking about the 17th century on Jamaica where people initially looked at that new acquisition that that England had in its imperial lineup and questioned whether it would be feasible to grow sugar on Jamaica because there were so many forests. And one of the concerns was that wouldn't lend itself to a slave society. It would create too many opportunities for slaves to disappear into those woods. Well, in point of fact, uh, clearing the lowlands of Jamaica becomes really the first phase of sugar production. And uh, it, it required an enormous investment of labor and it was such a uh, imposing task that the, the trees that were being felled to plant cane initially weren't seen as having particular value outside of the sugar plantation itself. So the mahogany was being used for uh, things like building sugar, um, uh, building the infrastructure for sugar plantations and housing and other kinds of very utilitarian purposes. Much of it apparently was just burned, uh, which always surprises contemporary people today when we think of mahogany as having a particular value as a tropical hardwood. Um, but there were just such vast quantities initially of it that people didn't quite know what to do with it. And an important turning point that I emphasize in my book is around 1721, the sugar planters on Jamaica see an opportunity when there is an effort in England to pass some legislation that would reduce uh, customs duties on things being brought in as naval imports. 
and the sugar planters actually lobbied to have mahogany included under this legislation so that it could come into England with reduced customs duties. And there are other factors that play into this as well. But that was enough to begin to sort of uh, encourage a consumer market for mahogany in England and later in the uh, North American colonies as well. And uh, then very quickly, beginning in the 1720s and accelerating right through uh, the mid-18th century, you see Jamaican mahogany become uh, one of the most important uh, materials being used by cabinet makers in Europe and in North America. Um, even while on Jamaica, it remains sort of a secondary um, form of plantation produce and is often actually quite hard to find in the record, you know, juxtaposed with increasing volumes of sugar being exported. I literally had to, you know, crawl through the archive, well not literally, <laughs> figuratively crawl through the archives, sometimes quite literally, looking for the, the splinters of mahogany in amongst the, you know, reports of the sugar exports that were being that were being uh, uh, sent out of the island. But interestingly, during this period, when mahogany you know, is holding its own as sort of a second tier export commodity, planters really preferred not to use their own enslaved workers to do that heavy duty work of extracting timber. So whereas initially they might have done that because they couldn't start planting until the land was cleared, now the focus became increasingly on sugar production. And what I argue that this sort of opens up is a space of opportunity for people who, who weren't large landowners and some of those people who, who get shut out as uh, land holdings begin to get consolidated by larger sugar planters. And, um, it became a very common practice that planters would actually job out large land clearing projects. And uh, as some of you may know, logging is an extremely arduous and hazardous form of uh, uh, labor. It's an extractive industry, which is pretty labor intensive, but it's also very dangerous and not something that uh, you can do easily unless you have experience in doing it. So rather than divert their own workers toward that sort of labor, planters began to bring in crews that would be more specialized to do this sort of work. So for example, um, when Edward Long was uh, reflecting on the planter economy in Jamaica and calculating the cost that it would require to establish a plantation, he assumes uh, that, quote, any new planter would hire laborers for cutting down the woods rather than employ his own Negroes. And uh, indeed, from what I was able to discern from the archival record, there are these rather shadowy figures. Many of them appear to be former indentured uh, servants who came uh, from England or other places who had some experience um, as woodcutters. And they oftentimes would have some of their own workers or they might use a few of the, the slaves from the, the plantation but they would where they were being employed. And then they would be compensated for their labor with uh, a share of the timber they caught. They, they cut, excuse me. So oftentimes that might be a quarter or a third of a share of the overall timber that they were taking from um, a larger plantation uh, owners' uh, un undeveloped lands. So they become very important in the overall economy of individual plantations, of you know, allowing new lands to be opened up for sugar planting. But for those individuals, it also creates a, a way for them to accumulate a little bit of uh, seed money of their own, perhaps to acquire a piece of land um, not in the lowland areas, but perhaps up in the more mountainous areas, which were less, uh, uh, less adapted for sugar cultivation. And a, a great example of this, I found one record of a man who, uh, named Samuel Rushton, who in his probate inventories 
he has an enumeration of a small provision ground that he was cultivating, nine head of cattle, and 35,000 feet of mahogany. So not a landowner, but someone perhaps who could you know, use that little uh, uh, crude material to actually you know, sell that and then turn it into something more than that. But what's very interesting is that over time, those sorts of individuals begin to get a little bit shut out. And I'll, I'll talk about why that was. Because you see, as the most accessible mahogany trees begin to get cut down, it becomes harder and harder uh, to extract mahogany from uh, more interior areas of the island. And uh, whereas the sugar planters, sorry, I've lost my outline here, uh, where larger sugar planters um, saw the opportunity to begin to hold on to their mahogany and wait for the value to increase, they begin to do that. So by the 1740s, all that's left in the lowland areas are described as small islands of mahogany in seas of cane. And that was the, the phrase that I took from my, the, the title of my paper, because I think that's sort of a very vivid image. So those little islands of mahogany, the planters begin to, you know, to realize that, that, that there's the value of those is only going to increase, and they begin to hold on to those. And there's a very interesting correlation then going forward that those last reserves of the most accessible mahogany are only cut when sugar planters absolutely need to uh, raise a little bit of cash. They become their insurance, their cash reserves. And so I was able actually to chart a correlation between declines in sugar production and sudden upsurges of mahogany production. Um, and occasionally, if they needed to uh, uh, clear a new piece of land, then they would actually kind of open the gates and bring in outside cutters again to, to, produce, more, um, to produce more mahogany. Um, but it becomes increasingly restrictive. And people who are trying to make a living at this, these freelance woodcutters, are increasingly pushed into areas of the interior of the island where it was much harder to extract the, the trees. The wonderful image you saw of the mountains uh, in, in the Caribbean, well, Jamaican mountains were pretty high. So the further woodcutters had to go and bring their, their cr crews of enslaved workers with them, the more expensive it was for them and the more difficult it was to extract that mahogany. So whereas the, you know, large planters sort of had the leisure to hold on to their mahogany and wait till the market really suited them and they really needed that infusion of cash to cut their final trees. The, these freelance woodcutters are getting pushed out and increasingly there are fewer and fewer of them. They tend to consolidate um, until there's just a handful of people who are still able to continue this. Um, and interestingly, they begin to make some efforts to lobby on their own behalf in order to try and uh, open up some of the less accessible parts of Jamaica and to get some assistance to do so. And there's a very interesting case that I looked at involving a man named John Whitaker, who actually goes to the Jamaican assembly and tries to get support to open up uh, the areas where he has acquired land with the hope that eventually he might actually be able to cultivate some mahogany in some of the interior valleys. But the way that he plans to do this is by funding it through cutting mahogany. So again, you know, that enters into this, this calculus. And he finds his initiative uh, sort of pulled between interests like Edward Long, who by then was back in England, and very concerned, really, at seeing the way in which the uh, small uh, um, landowners and the, 
free white population on Jamaica was being increasingly um, pushed out, he saw this sort of initiative of opening up the interior and using mahogany uh, cutting uh, as, as a means to do that. And he, he favors it, he pushes for this, largely because he sees it as an opportunity to try and bolster the free white population and to open up new lands at the same time. Huh. Much to his dismay, Mr. Whitaker, you know, even though pe people get what he's trying to do back in London, finds himself stymied by the established sugar planters on Jamaica, who are not interested, A, in seeing more mahogany coming to the market that would decrease the value of their own remaining stores, and B, they're not particularly interested in seeing someone like Mr. Whitaker expanding sugar production that they would create new competition. Uh, so by the late 18th century, you see this interrelationship whereby mahogany had been, as I said, complementary to sugar production suddenly it begins to be seen as potentially creating competition in ways that, that weren't welcome. Um, so the sort of the theme that runs through my book is one of the story of increasing scarcity and the way in which that uh, you know, influences people's day-to-day -day lives who are actually involved with the mahogany production. For example, many of the descriptions of you know, little hints here and there, it seems that the enslaved workers who were actually doing this work found it to be a welcome respite from, or, you know, preferential certainly to the very uh, intensive, unrelenting regimen of a sugar plantation. They found opportunities for mobility and a little bit more autonomy out working in the woods on wood cutting crews. Some of them even found ways to, to sell forest products sort of on the side, which is another kind of economy that develops. Other people get involved with the contraband trade, bringing mahogany in from other areas and then reselling it under the label of Jamaican mahogany. Um, but the notion that forests were incompatible with sugar plantations. Uh, you know, idea that you know in the 17th century was seen uh, as a as an obstacle becomes more of a freighted concern by the late 18th century as people begin to recognize that deforestation is a very real problem, and to begin to question whether the wholesale removal of forests to make way for sugar cane is the only way that plantation regimens could be managed. And the tensions that you see, I think, between uh, people who were trying to uh, hold on to the mahogany trees and people who are trying to uh, capitalize on them uh, is very interconnected with these debates over changing land uses and what the future of forests in the Caribbean w were going to be. And um, I don't have time to really go into this um, t today, but I explore it in some length in my book, the way in which people look at this problem, excuse me, they, they look at this problem and try to figure out different ways to address it. So it wasn't that people were unaware that there was this uh, conflict between sugar plantations and the forested lands that seemed to you know, fall uh, inevitably away, making, clearing the way for, for cane. And there was a lot of debate about the, at the time about how to manage this to the extent that after the Seven Years' War, there was a very interesting effort to actually set up uh, forest preserves um, on some of the newly acquired lands that England um, you know, comes out of, uh, possess in possession of after the Seven Years' War actually setting up forest preserves. And interestingly, the planter interests at that point um, support the idea because they realize that if places like Tobago are set aside as forest preserves, then they wouldn't have people growing sugar there, creating competition for them. Um, ultimately, uh, those initiatives uh, 
are unsuccessful, and most of those areas that had been uh, very heavily forested at the end of the Seven Years' War end up planted at, with sugarcane by the end of the 18th century. Um, and back on Jamaica, those islands that I had described um, by the end of the 18th century, we have descriptions instead of lowlands more or less denuded of mahogany trees. And uh, one of my favorite quotes was from William Beckford, who in 1790 points to this as something that people in the Caribbean should not be proud of, that this was a lesson that we should learn not to repeat uh, the destruction of forests in favor of a sea of ocean, uh, of sugar cane. And he actually concludes his discussion of this by pointing out that in areas once abundant with mahogany, the tree has become almost entirely extinct, he says. And upon those plantations, the works of which were formerly constructed of mahogany, there's hardly a tree now to be found. Thank you. So I just want to start by thanking the organizers uh, and all the attendants. This has been a <coughs> wonderful conference and I'm very, very happy to be, to be here sharing my, my, my early thoughts on, on what I expect will sometime develop into, into something much more uh, developed, complete, uh, exciting. Um, so let me just start with a very brief reference Oh, I never understand why, why they, in the change from Mac to, to computer, the, the nice, weird envelopes appeared. But <laughs> nice, there was, there was some, yeah, mail was, was, was Cartagena and Havana were, were, were important for, for, the, for, 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 for letters to travel, right? But, so I'm going to be focusing on, on the, the two circles that you see down there, this, the, the, the South Caribbean, we can call it the provinces of Santa Marta in red, the province of Cartagena in, in, in blue, in the, in the Caribbean coast of what is today Colombia, in the Caribbean coast of, of what was the, the Viceroyalty of New Granada. So I'm, I'm, I'm always using the Caribbean, Colombian, Caribbean, New Granada interchangeably. Um, in his recent Making a, Making a New World, Founding Capitalism in the Bajío and Spanish North America, John Tutino offers us his contribution to what he calls a fundamental rethinking of the rise of capitalism. This contribution to the old but renewed debate on the origins of capitalism stresses the role of Spanish North America, in particular the silver producing North Central Mexican region called the Bajío, as both an engine of global capitalism and as a proper capitalist society similar to that emerging in Britain during the 18th century. Making a new world not only claims a spot for the Bajío along with or above Europe, China, and the Caribbean as cradle of capitalism. With it, John Tutino adds his name to a long list of historians that includes Eric Williams, Fernand Brodel, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Robert Brenner, Manuel Moreno Fraginals, Kenneth Pomeranz, and Chris Bailey, just to name a few. Disagreements notwithstanding, these historians have collectively made a strong case for the centrality of commodities like silver, sugar, and cotton in the rise of capitalism. Collectively, these authors have also drawn a picture that, perhaps logically, privileges success stories and obscures attempts that did not result in a sustained in sustain and long-lasting contributions to the emerging capitalist system of the early modern world. In this paper, I seek to expand the scope of analysis by looking at failed efforts to develop plantation systems envisioned as development opportunities seeking to incorporate Caribbean New Granada into the emerging capitalist system of the late 18th century. In particular, I focus on the proposals of colonial bureaucrats Antonio Narvaez y La Torre and Antonio Caballero y Góngora, drafted between the late 1770s and the years immediately following the explosion of the Haitian Revolution. Joined by other less prominent members of New Granada's colonial bureaucracy, Narvaez and Caballero y Góngora sought, unsuccessfully, to follow the path of plantation societies in the Caribbean 
and turn the uncultivated and, und and underdeveloped provinces of Cartagena and Santa Marta into similar export-based societies thriving on production and export of sugar and cotton. First, let me establish how they, that they fail, right? And so this is my, sort of my sugar chronology, right? Uh, if we see what is uh, in, the, in, the, in the red square, we see the, the sugar migration after what it's called the, the, the sugar revolution, right? And, and what we don't see in the, in, the, in the chart is we don't see Caribbean Colombia, right? We, we also don't see explanations. And, I, and, and yesterday in a couple of papers in, in Bertie and Beam's paper and also in Stuart Schwartz, a lecture, we saw that the explanations are, are, are difficult. Are, we, we, we debate on that, right? Uh, so we don't see Caribbean Colombia here, and it's because there was no sugar revolution in, in, in Caribbean Colombia, right? Uh, but, there were, but there were efforts, right? And, I'm, and I'll, I'll focus on Narvaez's effort. Uh, the sugar revolution that started in Barbados in the 1640s and moved from there to other Caribbean islands and to Brazil did never reach Caribbean Colombia. While there were some, plant some sugar plantations or haciendas, if we follow the old but still very useful taxonomy of Sidney Mintz and Eric Wolf, sugar from Caribbean Colombia did not really figure among the commodities sent from the Americas to Europe during the late 18th century. Cotton. And here we see cotton, and the key is in green, we see the uh, British imports of, of raw cotton from the British West Indies. And we don't see Caribbean Colombia there, but there was some cotton pr being produced in Caribbean Colombia. And through the Free, free Trade, Free Ports Act, is, it was exported from Caribbean New Granada, from the province of Cartagena, to the British West Indies. So the exports of cotton from the British West Indies to, to, to Britain that appear there include a portion of cotton produced, actually produced in, in the province of, of, of Cartagena. Cotton from Caribbean Colombia, although some of it was cultivated and exported starting in the 1780s, followed a similar path to, to sugar from Caribbean Colombia. That neither sugar nor cotton succeeded in incorporating Caribbean Colombia into the global capitalist networks emerging during the late 18th century does not mean that they did not play fundamental roles in the ways in which colonial bureaucrats, merchants, and landowners envisioned the development of this region. Let me now turn to the, to the projects. Let's go back to the map so that you don't get distracted with cotton while I speak about sugar. <laughs> Narvaez's development strategy is best explained with reference to the very similar project drafted about 15 years later by Cuban intellectual Francisco Arangui Parreño, whose lobbying efforts and development projects are familiar to historians and largely credited with making sugar, with making Cuba's 19th century sugar boom possible. Arango's development project, best presented in his 1793 Discurso sobre la Agricultura de La Habana y Medios de Fomentarla, treatise on, the, on Havana's agriculture and, and means to, to promote it. Uh, it stands as the, as the most famous and successful argument for the development of plantation systems in the Spanish Caribbean, ranting against what he called Spaniards' auri sacra famis, sacred hunger for gold. Arango criticized Spain's mercantilist preference for and protection of mining and argued for agriculture and trade liberalization as the best avenues for wealth and development. The primacy of Arango's discurso has obscured similar projects advanced by Creole intellectuals in other Spanish Caribbean colonies. Arango's focus on sugar as the engine of growth similarly has eclipsed projects that proposed other crops as alternatives for economic development. In 1778, more than a decade before Arango y Parreño published his discurso, Narvaez wrote a long diagnosis of the state of the province of Santa Marta, in which he anticipated Arango's argument stating that Without agriculture, there cannot be trade. And without population, there cannot be agriculture. The crying, the current state of misery and poverty of the province of Santa Marta, while praising its near infinity, infinite agricultural possibilities, he claimed, for example, that the province was up for the production of, on a commercial scale, of wheat, cacao, sugar, cotton, tobacco, several varieties of dyewoods, cattle, coffee, vanilla, woods for constructions, 
quinine and other medicinal plants, tortoise shells and pearls. So he was saying this could be the, 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 the wealthiest province in the Americas and it's the, the, and it's the poorest, right? Uh, so Narvaez proposed the mass importation of slaves as the best way to turn the province into a source of immense prosperity for the kingdom of New Granada and the Spanish crown. In his opinion, importing slaves should make Santa Marta as prosperous as the British and French Caribbean islands whose administrators have placed their main focus on increasing the number of slaves as much as possible. Focusing on the French success in San Domingue, Narvaez's Narvaez claim, supported by stats that demonstrated an increase in the number of slaves from 206,000 in 1764 to 257,000 in 1767, these are stats for San Domingue, so Narvaez claimed that the increased number of slaves had led to a sharp increase in the production and export of sugar, indigo, cacao, coffee, and cotton. By also encouraging the growth of France's merchant navy, the higher number of slaves had ultimately increased France's wealth, navigation, and trade. In addition, because in contrast to British absentee planters, French sugar barons lived in the colony, Saint-Domingue and the other French sugar islands were not only the leading producers, but also the leading consumers of French manufacturers. Attempting to replicate France's success story, Narvaez asked the Spanish crown to facilitate through all possible means the introduction of African slaves because he believed they were the raw material of the raw materials that the Americas should produce. Once supplied with an adequate number of slaves, the province of Santa Marta could contribute to the wealth of Spain through four different means. The multiplication of its production and exports, the increase of, in the consumption of Spanish products, the increase in royal taxes, and the development of the Spanish Navy. Between 1789 and 1793, Narvaez's successor as governor of the province, José de Astigárraga, advanced similar proposals. Adding that, with enough official encouragement, Santa Marta could fill part of the sugar deficit created by the, by the Haitian Revolution. Replicating Narvaez's di diagnosis and arguments, Astigárraga informed the crown that the province was uncultivated and virgin. At that, since trade is the legitimate son of agriculture, and agriculture required caudal intelligencia y brazos, uh, capital, brains, or innovation, and, and labor. Astigarra claimed that promoting the importation of slaves was the best way to foster the province's development. While during the late 1770s, Spain's involvement in the American Revolution caused Narvaez's petition to fall on deaf ears, Astigarraga's proposal, together with those of Arangui Parreño and other Joronists in Cuba, Venezuela, and Rio de la Plata, Jorones or crybabies, the, the famous Jorones Cubanos who were always asking stuff from the crown and they were uh, powerful enough to, to get uh, things from the crown. Uh, so Narvaez's petition, uh, Astigarraga's proposal, met a better luck. Through a series of royal orders passed during 1791, New Granada Sports received authorization to engage in the free trade in slaves for a period of six years. Although during the 1790s and the first decade of the 19th century, some slaves were imported to New Granada, competing with Cuba for a limited supply of slaves proved to be a difficult task for the impoverished commercial elite of Caribbean Colombia. Moreover, comparing the navigation time separating Caribbean New Granada and Cuba from the main markets for sugar tilts the balance in favor of Cuban sugar. Proximity to both sources of labor and markets for sugar thus favored Cuba and harmed Caribbean Colombia. Now let's move on to cotton. While Narvaez's project focused on sugar, Viceroy Caballero y Góngora, in office for most of the 1780s, turned to cotton as the key to the economic development of the province of Cartagena. Caballero y Góngora's plan to develop cotton cultivation was an essential component of the Bourbon commercial policy aimed at diversifying New Granada's exports to Spain and increasing their value. The promotion of cotton cultivation was devised to serve two additional, though related, purposes. On the one hand, it would increase Spanish control of northwestern New Granada, a territory largely controlled by the unconquered Caledonio, Darien, or Cuna Cuna Indians, and frequently threatened by British adventurers. On the other hand, it was expected to contribute to a Spanish bread industrial revolution through the supply of raw materials for the growing textile industry of Catalonia. In pursuit of this last aim, 
The Spanish crown conceded tax exemptions to stimulate the cultivation and export of cotton. Initially proclaimed in 1776, the exceptions, the exemptions were ratified in the early 1780s, leading to a dramatic increase in raw cotton exports from Cartagena to Spain. Between 1785 and 1794, the boom period of Catalonia's textile industry, Cartagena's cotton exports to Spain grew threefold, jumping from roughly 272,000 pounds to 860,000 pounds. The commercial disruption brought about by the resumption of Anglo-Spanish conflict in 1796 brought this process to a halt, leaving New Granada's cotton growers with large stocks of cotton waiting for a buyer. The 1780s expansion of the cotton-based textile industry, of course, was not a process unique to Catalonia. This decade witnessed the beginning of a long-term trend characterized by a global lure for cotton, largely led by Britain from the emerging textile industry of Lancashire. Throughout the world, policymakers, colonial authorities, merchants, and entrepreneurs actively promoted cotton cultivation. Caballero y Góngora's projects were part of a global effort to which his counterparts in the British, French, Dutch, and Portuguese colonial worlds also contributed. While Cartagena increased its cotton exports to Spain, British colonies in the Caribbean, India, and Northern Africa began to export raw cotton to Britain. Dutch and Portuguese colonies in South America, as well as the French Caribbean via Jamaica through the Freeport Strait, were also exporting their cotton to Britain. Inventors and societies for the promotion of trade and industry were equally active in the promotion of technologies and schemes to increase cotton cultivation and manufacture. In 1788, five years before Eli Whitney registered his cotton gin, Spanish inventor Antonio de la Carrera asked for permission to travel to Cartagena to test his cotton gin in mach machine. In Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Society for the Encouragement of Manufacturers and the Useful Arts offered a prize to encourage the development of technologies to optimize cotton production. New technologies like James Watts' steam engine and Samuel Crompton's mule spinning were rapidly adopted in cotton production, resulting in what a historian accurately called a great leap in cotton production. The great leap in cotton production initiated in the second half of the 1780s continued during the 1790s and on into the 19th century. It was characterized by four important trends easily perceived in an analysis of British imports of raw cotton. First, Britain's thirst for cotton grew dramatically between 1781 and 1815. Second, while the amount of, of raw cotton exported from the British West Indies to Britain showed an upward trend, its participation in Britain's total imports declined steadily. Third, the United States exports of raw cotton to Britain skyrocketed through the period. And fourth, while the United States grew to become Britain's main supplier of cotton wool, the British thirst for raw cotton continued to require imports from Brazil, India, and Northern Africa. Cotton thus, connected Britain with the whole world. While the entire world, or its tropical and temperate areas, cultivated and gene cotton, uh, Britain spun it before returning it to the world in the form of cotton clothes. An important aspect of British imports of cotton wool from the British West Indies, not identifiable in the chart, is the participation of non-British Caribbean territories in the share of British West Indies cotton exports. While there is no statistical series to calculate the amount of cotton that the French, Dutch, and Spanish Caribbean colonies sold to the British West Indies for re-export to Britain, scattered quantitative and qualitative evidence provides useful information to speculate about New Granada's participation in this line of trade. During the initial phase of the cotton boom, before the United States entered the cotton scene, the British West Indies contributed most of the still meager quantities of raw cotton demanded by Britain. Between 1784 and 87, According to Jamaica planter Brian Edwards, about a third of the cotton wool exported from the British West Indies to Britain consisted of re-exports of produce cultivated in foreign colonies. For British policymakers, this was a constitutive element of the Freeport's policy inaugurated in 1766 and expanded in the aftermath of the American Revolution. The British West Indies, either by cultivating cotton or by buying it from foreign colonies, were envisioned as important suppliers of the British market for raw cotton. While during the 1780s, most of the foreign cotton imported in the British West Indies came from French Saint-Domingue, the eruption of the Haitian Revolution and the subsequent outbreak of Anglo-Spanish War transformed the Caribbean's cotton supply chain. Unable to ship their cotton cargoes to Spain, New Granada's cotton exporters resorted to trade with foreigners, including the British enemy. In 1796, 30% of the ships conducting trade between New Granada's ports and Jamaica included cotton in their cargoes. 
even before the 1796 war disrupted Spain's transatlantic trade, a good portion of the cotton cultivated in northern New Granada found its way to Britain via Jamaica. According to New Granada's customs director, while the greater part of the cotton produced in northern New Granada was exported to Spain, some, so, some short portions were shipped to Jamaica. The 1796-1808 Anglo-Spanish War and the 1808-1814 Napoleonic invasion of the Spanish Peninsula further shifted the balance in favor of Jamaica and thus Britain. In 1814, at the height of the British Freeport system, 48 of the 120 Spanish ships that sailed from New Granada to Jamaica transported raw cotton. At this point, more than a third of the raw cotton that entered Jamaica from foreign territories came from New Granada's ports. New Granada's growing participation in Jamaica's imports of raw cotton could lead to conclude that Caballero y Góngora's plans succeeded in incorporating northern New Granada to the emerging British-led capitalist system. To take this participation in Jamaica's imports as a measure of success, however, neglects the role geopolitical developments in the greater Caribbean played in New Granada's cotton export boom. A closer scrutiny reveals that New Granada's largest contribution to the British cotton trade coincided with the 1812-1814 war between Britain and the United States, a conflict that temporarily stopped British imports of U.S. raw cotton. Moreover, New Granada's cotton export boom took place at a time of crisis in Spain. Since Spain was invaded by Napoleon, New Granada's cotton merchants' sole outlet for their raw cotton was British Jamaica. In the final analysis, despite the redirection of its cotton exports to Jamaica, New Granada was relegated to the role of secondary supplier of raw cotton. Only at times when the U.S.-British cotton trade was disrupted could New Granada's merchants aspire to tap the British market. So to conclude, what can we make out of these two failed strategies to incorporate the Caribbean provinces of the Viceroyalty of New Granada into the emerging global capitalist system of the late 18th century? How does accounting for failed strategies contribute to the origin story of the rise of capitalism? My aim in this paper has not been to carve a space for Caribbean Colombia in the debate about the origins of capitalism. Rather, while sort of carving this space for Caribbean Colombia, I hope to think and to have you help me think about the analytical possibilities that can be opened by expanding the scope of capitalism's birthplaces through allowing entrepreneurial merchants and bureaucrats whose projects failed to play a part in this origin story. Origin stories can be dangerously and biasly teleological. They can and tend to silence actors, places, ideas, and projects that did not make it to fruition. Origin stories can and should also incorporate what, have ha what could have happened in order to provide a better understanding of what ended up happening. My brief account of the hopes, energy, ink, paper, and money that Narvaez, Astigarraga, Caballero y Góngora, and others invested or wasted, I hope, makes a good case for taking failures seriously in our efforts to understand the role of sugar, cotton, and other commodities in the emergence of global capitalism. That the sugar and cotton produced in Santa Marta and Cartagena did not prove valuable enough to turn these provinces into key pieces of the global capitalist puzzle of the late 18th century should not be taken as an intellectual shortcut to cut Caribbean New Granada and many other similar regions completely out of the picture of the rise of capitalism. If 50 years ago, E.P. Thompson sought quite successfully to rescue the poor stockinger, the luddite cropper, the obsolete handloom weaver, the utopian artisan, and even the deluded follower of Joanna Southcott from the enormous condescension of posterity, my much more modest hope here has been to share my early thoughts about what I hope may turn into a larger project that will rescue many lost voices from the success-based fundamental rethinking of the rise of capitalism. Thank you. So I think we have about 10 minutes of questions for these excellent papers that I think actually problematize the whole idea of competing economies by suggesting complementarity or uh, supportive networks or um, even counter challenges to the idea of competition.
question was, um, does Professor Giusti have documentation on the expansive nature of the, the mule trade um, to other places in the Caribbean? And the comparison with the cacao. Uh, Venezuela really had a very strong uh, presence in the cacao, uh, cacao exports to Europe. Um, I think there's some quantitative in, in uh, Aispurua, in Europe, if I'm, has, has some, some estimates about quantitative. Uh, I haven't looked that much into cacao production. Uh, of course, the cacao exports were uh, generally legal. So I think that the contraband was also kind of mixed in. The mule trade was, was mixed in with, with the cacao, which could be legal or could be illegal, depending on the, on the epoch, cacao. But the mule trade had a, had a big advantage in that. I know that the, the, the mule population of the Llanos, just interior in, the, in Venezuela, because Venezuela has a very mountainous coast, and then uh, just in the interior is the Llanos, which is a huge uh, plains area, and the estimates are for about 50,000 mules. Uh, uh, about, uh, no, over a million cattle and about 80,000 mules in the Llanos at any given time. So the, the amount of, 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 of exports was, was uh, 30,000 could even be a, a, a low figure. Uh, and they went through the mountains, which were very narrow. The mules had the advantage of being able to negotiate uh, narrow mountain passes. So they, they would bring in the mules to the coast, ostensibly it, uh, bringing in legal merchandise often, but then the mules would go on the contraband trade <laughs> also. So, uh, but yeah, there are, there are estimates, but I, I haven't looked at the, con at the cacao uh, t t trade uh, close enough to be able to make comparisons, but it was, it was very important. Jamaica, to be sure, always had mules, but uh, it was always about 30 or 40% short in terms of its demand for mules. Edward Long has some interesting figures on that. So Jamaica also. Barbados had a lot of wind power, so the windmills were very important in Barbados uh, throughout, as, 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 as uh, Mr. Peña confirmed me when we spoke yesterday, but, and uh, some of the Eastern Caribbeans had windmills, but the uh, mules were important throughout the Caribbean in all this period. So, so, so. So and from Colombia, for any, sure. any, any we look west, west of Venezuela, there are, and, and, and Narvaez has a couple of paragraphs on the, on the cattle trade and on the mule trade happening both legal and illegally, and how, and how, and, and he actually complains about, about about the, the untapped potentiality of the province of Santa Marta. He says, well, we are only exporting mules and we should, we should do better, we should do much more. It's a question for Jennifer. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I suspect I'm gonna find the answer uh, to my question in your book, which I hope to read in the next 10 days, but I thought I'd ask the question anyway. Uh, one of the key uh, narratives, of course, in sugar is its consumption and the extent to which the sort of consumption skyrockets over the course of the 18th century, and then there's a critique of consumption, uh, a moral critique of the consumption of sugar. I'm wondering to what extent um, uh, mahogany has any of that same uh, sort of moral baggage. Uh, and I, I'm thinking about this specifically, uh, there are a number of houses I'm an architectural historian, and there's a, a number of houses, villas outside of London uh, that are built with mahogany floors and, and mahogany doors, beginning about 18, uh, sorry, 1720s and 1730s, uh, well prior to any moral critique. I'm wondering to what extent is mahogany assigned to Jamaica in the British imaginary, and, to, and d does it ever have a moral critique like sugar does? Okay, so the question is, is there a moral critique of the consumption of mahogany similar to the moral critique that we've discussed previously of the consumption of sugar? Thank you for the question. Um, I do address this a bit in my book because it's quite interesting that it comes a bit belatedly to the same critique is levied against mahogany as against sugar, but it comes a bit later and actually becomes an object of, uh, of mockery on the part of uh, you know, anti-abolitionists who make fun of people signing petitions against sugar while writing on their mahogany desks. And there is also a distinction drawn uh, 
by some in the quality of the material, and it comes back to this discussion yesterday about drawing a line between uh, necessity and utility, as well as ephemerality versus durability. So, in other words, slavery invested in mahogany, it was invested in something that had a long life and could, you know, you know, be passed from generation to generation as mahogany furnishings often were, whereas sugar, you had your little taste of sweet, bloody sweet, and then it was gone. Um, by the 19th century, it becomes a much more uh, direct critique of people like Dickens who, who specifically talk about those mahogany lined houses in Liverpool um, and the slave labor that created that wealth. two questions there. The first is, what were the mules involved in the contraband the trade carrying, and how was it marketed? And the other was about the, the role of the uplands in, in Colombia, did you mean? Colombia, yeah. Well, what I'm saying is what is not play a major role in what happened to the lowlands. Okay, right. so what is the connection between the uplands and the lowlands? Right. Uh, the mules were traded for slaves. That's what the, 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 the the Spanish part of Hispaniola, uh, often the, the, the cattlemen wanted, was to trade for slaves, but very often, perhaps even more often, uh, for French uh, textiles, uh, clothing, uh, even rum produced in, in, in Saint-Domingue, uh, manufactured products, uh, 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 iron implements, agricultural implements, that kind of thing. So very varied manufactured products, uh, garments, textiles, uh, but slaves were, were uh, very often present. And not that it increased the slave population in Eastern Hispaniola considerably, though. So the, the question is a, is, a, is a very good one, and, there's a, and there's, there's a, there are a couple of very interesting, uh, or very good books on the, on the connections and the rivalries between coast and interior, and this coast and interior rivalry, lowland high, highlands, it's, a, it's, a, it's central to Colombian history from the colonial period until, until today, right? The, uh, there was definitely a, a, the, the two major urban centers in, in, in the Viceroyalty of New Granada were Cartagena by the Caribbean coast and Santa Fe, the capital in the, in the interior, right? They, they, they were, there was a, a, a strong back and forth a strong rivalry uh, with with Santa with Santa Fe being Santa Fe now Bogota being the, 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 the center of political power Cartagena being the center of commercial dynamism uh, both uh, elites in both in both cities arguing for 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 for, for opposite uh, privileges in in, the, in 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 Spain right. Uh, the Cartagena merchant elite being, uh, in a sense, powerful enough to to get it to to to, to get it, 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 it to get its way in in, in 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 the Spanish in the Spanish crown, right? Uh, so so there's definitely this connection, this rivalry. For other populations in Caribbean Colombia, I mentioned the the Calidonios or Cunas. Uh, there were also the 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 Wayu, which the Spaniards called the, the Wajiros. For these uh, unconquered indigenous people, the Spaniards called them Indios Barbaros, right? Uh, they, they really couldn't care less about the interior. 
they lived in a in a in a world they they, they lived in complete autonomy. Spanish officials complain about these people being independent, right? And and they complain about their inability to conquer them because once they get there, on, they were sent on pacification campaigns, right? And the and the Spanish office officers uh, return to the to the provincial capital, saying, "Hey, there's like you know they've got British guns. We had our, our old Spanish guns. There's there's nothing we can do." So for this for these indigenous people, their their world and their world view was very much about interaction with the Caribbean and, and there was a, they, 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 they were not very much, they couldn't care less about the, the, the interior and about the formal uh, Spanish political administrative structure. I should add briefly on the slave component of this trade that while it, it can feed into the narrative of serial sugar revolutions because the slaves could and did, for example, in Cuba and in Puerto Rico, that trade in livestock for slaves could form, did form part of the development of plantation production in Cuba and Puerto Rico. In Santo Domingo, it was short-circuited by the Haitian Revolution and the conquest. It, uh, so there is a connection, and one can argue, for the serial sugar revolutions to some extent. What I'm concerned about with that model is that it tends to uh, negate the autonomy, the historical specificity of those Spanish colonies before the sugar revolution. Uh, and tends to see everything in terms of the overshadowed plantation. Everything is prior, preparatory to the sugar revolution. And really, things were more, much more complex than that. But the slaves did play a role in Cuba in particular, southern Cuba, uh, the, the, the area of, 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 uh, of Olguin and, and the area of uh, Camagüey. Uh, the, the, the mule trade was very important with, uh, with Trinidad where centrals, sugar centrals developed very powerfully. That area was heavily involved in contraband with Jamaica, and slaves were an important part of that. Yeah. I think we'll have to stop there. We're out of time, but I would encourage people to talk to the speakers individually.